Where is God at work in your life? When was the last time God spoke to you? We're doing a series at the moment called The Six Marks of a Healthy Church. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. If you don't own a Bible or you're just new with us, there are Bibles in the seats in front of you. And the part of the Bible that we're going to be looking at this morning is found on page number 947 in that Bible. Now, in the Bible, there are big numbers and there are small numbers. The big numbers in the Bible are the chapter numbers. The small numbers are the verse numbers. And so if you look down on the page, you'll see right down in the bottom corner is a big 12. And that's where we're going to be studying today. But we're doing this series um, called The Six Marks of a Healthy Church. Because what we discussed last week is we said last week that it is God who builds the church, and so we can't actually grow the church, but while it's God who builds the church, we are responsible to be a healthy church. And we saw last week that a healthy church, its health is based upon the health of the members of that church. Just as the health of your body is largely based on the health of the cells within your body, the health of this church will really be determined by the spiritual health of the people who belong to this church. And so what we're doing every single Sunday as we study Romans 12 is we're looking at one particular mark of the church, and I'm hoping that you will go home and you will look at that mark and you'll evaluate your life, and you'll see whether you are living a healthy Christian life, whether you are living out that biblical mark of health in your own walk with God. And in the very first week, we saw the first mark of a healthy church is that in a healthy church, we, we receive grace and we respond with lives of surrender. In a healthy church, the members of the church are not trying to work their way up to God or work their acceptance with God. They receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus, but then they respond with lives of surrender. They respond by laying down their life and saying, Jesus, I'm gonna live for you wholeheartedly every single day. I wonder, is that you? Do you receive grace and respond with a life of surrender? Well, the second mark of a healthy healthy church is, as we see up here, it's to renew daily. In a healthy church, the members of a healthy church are daily pursuing the renewal of their minds by engaging with the Word of God. In a healthy church, the members of a healthy church are daily renewing their minds by engaging in the discipline of Bible study, Bible reading, and Bible meditation. Now, where do I get this from? Well, look down in your Bibles in Romans 12, verse 2, or look up on the screen. This is what Paul says. He says, Do not be conformed to this world or to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, when you look at this verse, you can break it up into three different parts. First, you have a negative command. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Then you have a positive command, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you have a result that by testing you might discern what the will of God is. So what I want to do this morning as I unpack this second mark of a healthy church is I'm going to go through these different parts and just explain them to you. So let's look at the first part, the negative command. Do not be conformed to this world or to the pattern of this world. Now, the interesting thing about this little line in Greek, the Bible was originally written in Greek. It wasn't written in English. See, what happened was the Greeks under Alexander the Great conquered the then known world. And so Greek became the language of the empire. And so when the New Testament was written, it was written in the language of the ordinary people, which was Greek. But it's interesting, in Greek, this phrase, be conformed to the pattern, is actually one word. It's actually the Greek word, schematzo, from which we get the English words like scheme. Now, a scheme is like something nefarious. You know, people have schemes. Or like schemata, the word schemata, I had to look it up on Google, it means it's like a principle out of which organizes a whole heap of thought, that's a a schemata. And interestingly, um, Weiss in his um, uh, Bible study word tool, he says that schematzo therefore refers 
to the act of an individual assuming an outward expression, so they assume an outward expression that does not come from within him, nor is it representative of his inner heart life. So Paul is saying, don't be conformed to this outward. Don't let your lifestyle, your outward behavior, what you do on the outside, be conformed to the pattern of this age. Now, it's interesting, that last little, oh, that last little phrase of this world, it's interesting that in Greek again, the word for world that Paul uses there is not the typical Greek word for world. The typical Greek word for world in the New Testament is the word cosmos. This word is actually the word aeon, aeon. You see, from a Jewish perspective, the Jews divided time into two eras. The present evil age ruled over by sin and brokenness, and then the age to come when God's kingdom would come, the perfect age where God would reign and rule. And so Paul is saying, don't let your lifestyle, don't let your behavior be influenced by this present wicked age in which we now live. You see, here's the warning that Paul is giving us. The warning is this, is that on the inside, you can be a child of God who's been transformed by the Spirit of God. And if you've come to God, you've been transformed on the inside and changed. But yet your outward behavior, your lifestyle, the choices you make every day can be shaped by the patterns of this world. It happens all the time. You know, um, it's interesting, Tegan and I, we spent four years in the United States studying in, in, in Texas. And when we went there, um, they loved my Australian accent. They really did. Crocodile Hunter, Steve Irwin, has, was just popular uh, on uh, one of the channels. And so everyone loved the Australian accent. They loved listening to what I had to say. And you know what, to be honest, I sort of hammed it up a bit more. Now, you can't imagine me doing that, but I, I did. I hammed it up a bit more. So, like, when I'd meet people, I'd go, G'day, mate, how you going? You know, put on a bit of ochre. They loved it, loved it, completely loved it. But when we came back after four years, do you know what our family and friends said to us? They said, you sound so American. The Americans thought that, like, we sound like Australians, but the Australians said, you guys sound so American. Our three daughters, Hannah, Abby, and Emma, who were with us in America, they certainly had thick, rich Texas accents. They would say, howdy, y'all, you know, do that sort of stuff. <laughs> we didn't even realize. But by living in America, slowly and slowly, our language was changing. It was being conformed to the culture around us. You might not even realize what this culture is doing and how it's exerting this pressure on you. So internally, you're like a child of God, but externally in your lifestyle and the choices that you make, they just come from the patterns of this world. You know, every time I go to Nepal on a mission trip for, for even one week and I step outside of our culture, I am just hit by how worldly I am, by how I've adopted patterns in my life that don't come from here, but they come from the world. You know, last week I told you that I've been reading this book by John Mark Homer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I wish I could give you all a copy. I wish I could buy you all a copy. And in this book, he has one of the early chapters is The History of Speed, where he speaks about how time and how hurry and how busyness has been, how our life has been speeding up. He, he starts out by saying, you know, a thousand years ago or so, you know, people, get this, you won't believe this, but people went to bed when the sun went down. Guess what happened when the sun came up? They got up and they went to work. That's how life worked. In summer, the days were longer. In winter, the days were shorter, and it gave this rhythm to people's lives. But this all changed in 1370, because you know what happened in 1370? The first clock was erected in a town square. And now man had thought that he had now made this advance and he had now, you know, taken it out of the realm of the seasons and now he was his own, you know, he was, he was making his own destiny and, and make, forging his own way. But little did he know that he was actually coming under the control of a machine. And in the last hundred years, things have amped up 
and increased rapidly. John Mark Homer speaks about how in the 1950s in North America, the Senate in the, in, uh, of America, they were doing studies and they were saying, they were projecting that by uh, you know, the 21st century, people will be working 21 weeks a year and they'll be working for 22 hours a week. That's what they projected. That with all the technological advances and all that we have, all of that sort of thing, people will only, only get to work, they only have to work 21 weeks a year and only 22 hours a week. But that hasn't happened, has it? That hasn't happened. Even though we have all of these machines, we have dishwashers, praise God, we have dryers, we have all these fantastic machines. We, we can heat our homes. You, you don't have to go in the winter and chop wood and, and bring it in and roast a fire to heat up your home. But yet we're as busy and stressed out as ever. You know, before 1879, before Edison invented the light bulb, the average person got 11 hours sleep a night. Just try that on for size. In 2007, people say that that was a defining moment. That's when the digital age began, because what happened in 2007? The iPhone. iPhone. Steve Jobs came out and announced the iPhone, and it has changed the world forever. Now the average person touches their iPhone 2,617 times a day. And tech giants in Silicon Valley, they have done this. They, they are writing the software in such a way in order to grab our attention and to distract us. I have a quote here from the first um, president of Facebook. Uh, just put up, a, uh, it, it was Justin Timberlake in the movie, if you remember the movie on Facebook. <laughs> Uh, he writes this, Sean writes this, he was actually also the founder of Napster, if you remember that sort of platform, you probably shouldn't have back in the early 2000s. But this is what he writes, he says, God only knows what it's doing with our children's brains, and he's speaking about smartphones and social media. He says, the thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit. Dopamine is the pleasure center of your brain every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you more likes and comments. It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing, <laughs> I find this interesting, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you asked the question before you bought one of these, should I really do this? Does God want me to have this? Or did you just follow the pattern of the world thinking that you can't live without this, you need this? Ooh, that's convicting. How many of you before you signed up to Netflix or whatever subscription you have, how many of you asked the question, is this good? Is this what God wants me to do? Because Netflix is set up in such a way that as soon as one episode finishes, what happens? It counts down, three, two, one, and another one begins. It's set up to make us binge watch TV and movies, to suck and distract time out of us. How many of you asked the question whether that is what God wants us to do? You see, the danger, my friends, is that you might be a Christian on the inside, a child of God, and yet your outward lifestyle, your behavior is being shaped by the patterns of this world. And that's why you need to take stock every now and again, and maybe after this message, you need to go home and take stock of your life. I've done it. After reading this book, I... I've now decided that I'm gonna turn off my phone as soon as I come in my heart and into my home because studies have been done that say just having your phone on in your room raises your level of anxiety. Do you need to take some stock of what, 
of how you've been conformed to the pattern of this world. Because let me tell you something. You don't want to get to the end of your life on your deathbed. And then you realize, I built a fantastic business, but I lost my family, the pattern of this world. You don't want to come to your deathbed and think, man, I watched 14 seasons of you fill in the blank, but you never learn how to pray and develop an intimacy with God, the God that you're going to worship for the rest of eternity. You don't want to get to the end of your life, families, and think, man, my son is a really good sportsman, or my daughter is a really good sportswoman, but they don't really love God. Because your family was conformed to the pattern of this world. Do you realize it's exerting this, and I, and I don't think we mean to do it intentionally, we just get sucked in. And Paul says, don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. Take stock of your life. Have a good look at your life. Are you taking one day out of the week just to stop? That's what Sabbath is. The word sabbat, Sabbath means stop, rest, worship God. Or you're so busy that you have no time to reflect. No time to think, no time to ponder deeply about life and about God and about family. No time to just live. Enjoy relationships, enjoy your wife, enjoy your kids, enjoy your friends. Don't get sucked into the pattern of this world. That's what Paul is saying. But, here's the good news. (laughs) Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transformed in Greek is, once again, it comes from, uh, we get an English word, metamorphosis, from that word. And we all know what metamorphosis is, like a caterpillar. If you've read the, uh, the Hungry Caterpillar to your kids, the Hungry Caterpillar eats all this food and he eats all these things through the different pages, and then he goes into a cocoon, and what happens when he comes out of the cocoon? What is he? A beautiful butterfly. And this word actually is used over in the Gospels to describe how when Jesus was on the Mount Transfiguration, you know, and it says that he was transfigured before the disciples. So what what his true essence was, his glory was seen. He was metamorphosized before them. So they saw the divine glory of the Son of God in blazing white. This is the same word. And Paul says we need to be transformed. We need what is on the inside as children of God who have been changed by God to come out on the outside in our lives, in our lifestyle, in our choices, in our behaviors. But how does this happen? He says it happens by the renewing of your mind. The way that you think will determine the course of your life. Now, a parallel passage to this is actually Psalm 1. So I want to just go to Psalm 1 now and just take you through Psalm 1. It's a beautiful psalm, Psalm 1. It says, blessed is the man or person. Now, when you hear the word blessed, think happy. Can everyone say that? Happy, happy. All right, say it a little bit louder, all right? Happy. So this is saying, how happy is the person? Man, how happy is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. They don't follow the way of the wicked at all. But, the psalmist writes, his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree, and he's using here a metaphor. He's like a tree that is planted by streams of living water. You know, a tree that's planted by a stream, it doesn't matter whether it goes through a season of drought, because those roots go deep down into the stream and they draws forth nourishment from the stream. Even if the stream is barren, there's still water often underneath the stream that the tree can draw from. So he is like a, a tree planted by streams of living water. It doesn't matter what season they go through. They yield their fruit in season and its leaf does not wither and in all that he does, he prospers. You see, this is the key to the happy life. 
you want a happy life? You don't walk in the counsel of the wicked, but you delight in the word of God and on his word, you meditate day and night. Now meditation, Christian meditation is not Eastern meditation. It's not like you remove all thoughts from your mind and start to become one with the universe. No, Christian meditation is actually filling your mind with God's truth, filling your mind with thoughts about God and his promises and who he is and his character, mulling that over through the moments of your day, going slow over verses, going slow. Don't rush. Take time to think through what does this, what does this verse drip and, and filter out every piece of meaning in a verse. That's what Christian meditation is. And when you do that, your mind will be renewed. You'll have a renewed mind. And then you'll be able to do what Paul says next in the verse. The result will be this in verse 2. Look in verse 2. What will happen is that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. Is if you have this renewed mind, because you're daily meditating night and day on the word of God, then what happens when you go through testing, and you will go through testing, you will know what the will of God is. You will know how you are to respond to that. Um, one of the biggest moments of testing that I ever experienced in my life happened six months before I moved here to become the pastor in 2010. Uh, Tegan and I were at uh, my, my parents' place, and my parents had a pool. And the kids were going for a swim in the pool. And what ended up happening was that um, Abby, who was swimming, she got out. Aunt Hannah got out. And this left Ava in the pool and by herself, and she got out. And I wasn't watching, and I wasn't thinking. I was talking to my father, and I took her floaties off, Ava. And so, didn't even realize, but Ava jumped in the pool, and she sunk to the bottom. And the next thing I remember was Abby fishing Ava's lifeless body out of the bottom of the pool. She was blue. And I just could not believe it. It was testing. My faith was being put through the fire. And... Fortunately, Tegan is a nurse, and her nursing training kicked in, and she did CPR on Ava. And after the longest three minutes of my life, Ava recovered. And she went to the hospital. She had pneumonia, but she was okay, and she's with us today. Praise God. She's now 13. Praise God. Praise God. But I remember going to sleep that night or trying to rest that night after all of that stuff had happened. So difficult to go to sleep when something like that's happened. And in my heart, there was all these things that were coming up in my heart. God, how dare you do this to me? I'm wanting to serve you. I'm a pastor. I'm, wanting, I'm, going, I'm laying my whole life on the line. I'm going to Adelaide of all places to be a pastor. <laughs> how dare you do this to me, God? But you know what came back to my mind? Is the promises of God's word. Is the truth of God's scripture in that, world, in, that, in that time. It's like the Lord said to me, why can't I allow this to happen to you? Will you trust me? Will you serve me? Will you allow my peace to rule over your heart and life? Or will you, or will you rule over my heart, your heart and life? You see, that's how you're transformed. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get into the word, meditate on the word, put it in your heart so that when the day of testing comes, and it will come, you'll know what the will of God is. You'll know how you should respond in that moment when that happens. 
and you will grow and you will reflect and you will look like Jesus. So the second mark of a healthy church is that all the members of the church are daily seeking to renew their minds through the Word of God. That's why this year we've given you the New Testament reading challenge so that we're all reading through the New Testament together as a church family and we're doing it in community so that we're all growing together and seeking God together and learning together as a church family. Man, I hope you'll join us in that endeavor. I hope you'll join us. Well, let me pray. Lord, we come before you today and there are many different people who are going through testing times right now. Testing times, difficult times, Lord. But in the midst of difficult times, we can have your peace. We can have your joy. We can actually bear fruit in that season. We can prosper in that season. We can have joy, have happiness in that season because if we have renewed minds, and so God, I pray that you give us a hunger for the Bible, just an insatiable hunger for the scriptures. May me recognize, Lord, that this, in, this, in this scripture, your spirit uses this to speak to us, to talk to us, so that we talk to you in prayer and you speak to us through your word. And we can have a day-by-day -day relationship with you, a real relationship with you, God. And that's what you want from us. You want, don't just want a one-day-a-week relationship where we come in here and worship you together, but you want a day-by-day -day relationship with us, God. And I just pray that you would give us such a hunger as a church family that every single one of us would be in the Word together, reading the Bible together, so that we would grow and have renewed minds and be transformed. And what you've placed on the inside of us, the new nature that you've given us would come out on the outside in the way that we live, the choices that we make, the responses that we give, the words that we speak, the attitudes that we adopt, all of that stuff would reflect Jesus. So we pray this now in the name of Jesus for his glory and honor. And God's people said, amen. Let's stand together. Let's surrender everything.